Hi, I'm Jonathan Friend, head of the Department of Aerospace Engineering here at the University of Illinois. But none of you is here to see me or watch me. Uh, we have many tremendous students here. We have many high-impact alumni, but perhaps none quite as inspirational as Mike Hopkins. We are very pleased to be talking with him today while he's in orbit. Um, welcome, Mike. And let's just get right on to our first question. Are you there? I am here, and it is great to be with the University of Illinois and the Fighting Illini. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Hi, I'm Greg Mayer, 1987 aerospace engineering alum from the University of Illinois. My question is, who is the teacher or professor who had the most positive impact on your education and development that helped you become an astronaut? And why was that person so impactful? Yeah, so the, um, a great question. And, and I have to say, Professor Pressing was, uh, was probably that professor for me. Uh, for a couple reasons, uh, he was my advisor. And so that means he made sure that I had all the courses and uh, that I needed to graduate. Uh, but then I suspect you probably had some classes with, with Professor Pressing as well, and, and really just who he is and, and how he taught and his manner and his very calm and, and, and way that he could take a very complicated subject and, and make it seem reasonable. Um, I, I tend to run pretty intense, and, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, being in class, if I was having trouble with something with him, he would be able to bring it down uh, and help me understand it in a way that, that's really stood with me. And so he's, he was a great mentor and uh, a great advisor, great professor for me, and, and really helped me along my uh, journey to becoming an astronaut. Hi, I'm John Lawrence, 1991 aerospace alum and Illini football teammate from 1988. My question is, how did your preparation for your second tour in the ISS change based on your prior experience? Hey, it's great talking with you. And uh, man, that's been a long time ago, hasn't it? Uh, so let's see, how did it change now that it's my second mission? Uh, I, you know, I think the first thing, you just kind of know what to expect when you get up here. Um, you know, I know how my body's going to react in the microgravity environment. So you're not as, as nervous, say, about um, am I going to get motion sick or not get motion sick because you've, you've been there before. It also helped in just going through the training program uh, because I knew what was important. I, I knew the things that I really needed to focus on. I knew some of the things that, that maybe I didn't have to spend as much time working on. And and, um, and then the other thing, some of the simple things, like when you get up here, we get uh, bonus food, for example. Uh, so we have kind of a standard menu that, that we eat off of, but you do get a few packages of special food that you may want. And so I knew the, the types of food that would be good um, for, for those bonus packages. Um, I knew what to expect from a clothes standpoint, too, because we get inputs into that. And, and so what's... Uh, what works, what, you know, how do you keep it simple and, and all of those. So, so really it just, uh, it helped kind of make things uh, a little easier, if you will, as I went through the, the preparation and the training for this mission. Hi, I'm Zach Sims, current aerospace engineering student at the University of Illinois. My question is, Spaceflight comes with some inherent risks. Mission coordinators, vehicle designers, and other engineers work to mitigate those risks. How do you prepare yourself mentally for the stresses you might face? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and I think the, the simple answer is training. Um, and, and that really applies to anything that, that you're doing, you know, on the, uh, on the ground uh, when you're getting ready for a big test uh, for, or if you're uh, playing football and you're on the team or the basketball team, how do you get ready for a game? Um, all of those, uh, um, that training, you know when you're ready for a test. You know when you're ready to um, go out on the field and play the game. And so training is a, is a big part of that because it gives you confidence that you can handle whatever situation uh, shows up. 
the other thing I would say is uh, certainly this business can be stressful, particularly uh, certain events like the launches, the landings, when you go out on spacewalks. And we have procedures that we follow for all of those events. And so a lot of times you're just following the procedures while that uh, stressful event is going on. And so you're very focused on, on um, you know, making sure that you're monitoring what you're supposed to be monitoring. You're very focused on what's the next step that I need to do, uh, not the 10th step or the 20th step down the line. You just kind of focus step by step. And, and then all of a sudden you find yourself getting through these high stress, high risk type events. And so again, just like on the ground up here is the same thing, training, um, studying, preparation, that's key. Hi, I'm Stella Ellermitz, a fourth grader at University Primary School in Illinois. My question is, do you miss anything from Earth? And when you're on Earth, do you miss anything from space? I love that question, and the answer is yes. Uh, you know, I miss my family on Earth. Um, that's uh, that's one of the things. We're up here for six months at a time. Uh, my crewmate, Kate Rubens, who's actually getting ready to go home, she came up on a Russian vehicle, and so she actually left home nine months ago, and, and so she hasn't been home in quite some time. And so family is something that, that I think all of us miss on a, on a daily basis while we're up here. Uh, but you know, there's some other things that I miss that you don't really think about. Uh, for example, I miss weather. And, you know, up here, it's always 70 degrees, there's no wind, there's no snow, rain, um, the sun's not shining on you, or anything. there's no change uh, to the weather. And, you, and when you're up here, or actually, I didn't realize that my first flight until I got home back on Earth, and I was standing outside, and, uh, and it was raining, and I was just letting the rain fall on me, and I was realizing how much I had missed the weather. And so there are certainly a lot of things. You know, the other thing I miss about Earth is just being around people, um, random people, people that you just happen to bump into, things of that nature. Uh, you don't get that up here either. <laughs> if anybody comes up here, it's for a very specific purpose. Now, am I going to miss uh, space? You bet. One of the things I'm going to miss about space is being able to do something like this, because you certainly can't do this down on Earth. Um, but, uh, you know, there's other things like the views are pretty incredible, and, and so I'm certainly going to miss that. But one thing I would tell you is... I know, I know for a fact that uh, I'm not going to miss space as much as I miss Earth. And, and so it is great to be up here, and I love every minute of it, but I really love being home uh, with my family. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's a, I don't know, sometimes you have to leave something to realize how, just how important and special it is. Hi, my name is Soma Sarathi and I currently attend Solana Beach School District in California. My question is, how does it feel to float in space and see our beloved planet surrounded by the stars? I don't think I quite heard the question. Can, can you repeat it just one more time? Hi, my name is Soma Sarathi and I currently attend Solana Beach School District in California. My question is, how does it feel to float in space and see our beloved planet surrounded by the stars? How does it feel to float in space? It feels incredible. You know, one of the things I found about floating is it's very hard to describe what it's like uh, to people on Earth, because we don't have, there's no comparison for floating. Um, there's no comparison, you know, when I just flipped upside down, when I did that, the blood doesn't rush to my head. And so it's very hard to describe what that is, what that is like. Um, and, you know, so it's not like swimming, because even when you swim, if you die, go heads down, the blood's going to rush to your head. It's not like flying like a bird does or anything like that. Uh, but there is a certain freedom, a certain 
grace to to floating um, that that's really pretty special and what's it like to be out amongst the the see the planets uh, the earth with the stars around it I, I tell you it is um, it is unbelievable it really takes your breath away and, and kind of interesting we just recently moved our vehicle that we came up on to the top of space station and that's actually where I'm living in the SpaceX crew dragon resilience that's my crew quarters and it has windows and I get to look out at the stars at night I get to see the Milky Way um, every night as I'm going to, to bed, and it uh, it just never gets old. You, you feel like you can just reach out and, and grab them. Hi, I'm Lucas Merriman. I attend Monticello Middle School in Illinois. My question is, what is it like to see major weather events from space? You know, it's uh, it's pretty amazing because you oftentimes get to see the entire weather event from space, not just a small portion of it. And so, for example, uh, oftentimes during hurricane or uh, the typhoon seasons, you get to see that whole hurricane and you can see the swirl and the eye of the storm. And and oftentimes we're grabbing cameras and we're taking pictures of it. Um, and and so it's it's amazing. It's beautiful. And but then. You kind of have to sit back and, and think about it because there's a lot of people that are at risk during those major weather events like that. Uh, the same thing when we oftentimes, like when we fly over Africa, you see a lot of lightning storms from above. And and that's pretty incredible the way the the lightning flashes and it and it's and it shows up uh, in the clouds. That it's it's incredible to see, but again, um, sometimes those events uh, put pe people in danger on on the ground. And then, for example, um, you know, one of the things that we can see is uh, this year over the winter, and it looked like it was a cold winter in the U.S. because the snow you can actually see the snow line and how far south it gets, and it got pretty far south this year. So uh, pretty incredible to see, but you got to try and keep it in perspective. Hi, I'm Tony Adams, a defensive back here for the Illini football team and a political science student. I was wondering, is there anything you learned from your coaches that has helped you tackle tough issues along the way? Hey, Tony, yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, and I love watching you play, man. I appreciate uh, all that you're doing for the for the team. Um, yeah, what did I learn from the coaches? You know, one of the things I, I that's kind of stuck with me, and it may sound simple, but it, it really plays out in life as well as on, on the football field. Uh, so, you know, I was a defensive back as well. And, um, you know, one of the things we emphasized was never quitting on a play. And so we had these drills and it'd be at the end of practice where uh, they, we would, there wouldn't be an offense, um, uh, practice offense against us, a scout team offense against us. We would just line up. The coaches would uh, take a, sn a step back and he'd throw the ball somewhere down the field and we'd all have to pursue to the ball. And you just never quit on a play. Never, ever quit until you got to the, to the, uh, to the ball. And that's one of the things that stuck with me throughout. Um, you know, just to become an astronaut, it took me 12 years, uh, four applications. I got three rejection letters. And so never quitting on a play in football has transformed translated for me, never quitting on giving up on my dream of, of becoming an, an astronaut. Um, and so I think that was important. Uh, some other things that I, I got from the coaches, you know, my, uh, my defensive back coach, he was a Marine in, um, in Vietnam. And one of the things he was was good about as well is keeping it in perspective. You know, sometimes we would be griping about uh, two a days or something of that nature, and and he would remind us that you know life's not too bad for us uh, getting to play football. And, and so it's good to keep things in perspective. And and so I that's kind of stuck with me as well, and I try to remember that. And then um, you know there, guys, there was so much that I took from the coaches, and and I guess one of the other ones is. When you uh, take advantage of opportunities, you know, I was a walk on. Um, I, I was just happy to be on the team. Uh, and and yet I remember them talking about, you know, if you're third or fourth string, you just never know. And that's what happened to me, um, where all of a sudden uh, third string free safety, somebody goes down, somebody else goes down and, and you're looking at, um, uh, you know, you're playing Michigan for the Big Ten championship. It's the second quarter and all of a sudden you're on the field. Um, and so taking advantage of those opportunities, I would say all of those things have, have served me well uh, throughout the, my career. Hi, I'm Doug Kramer, Jr., offensive lineman for the University of Illinois football team and current grad student. 
Uh, my question for you today is if there's any lessons or experiences specifically from your teammates um, that really helped you develop your leadership skills that you still use today. Hey, Doug, yeah, thanks for the question. I love watching you play as well, and uh, thanks for all the years that uh, you've put in, and, and glad to hear you're coming back next year as well. You know, um, this one's going to be hard for me to talk about, but uh, there's there's some truth to it. You know, I, I had the privilege of being the captain my senior year, um, and this was my fifth year, um, and I – Quite frankly, I feel like I failed as as a captain. I did not provide good leadership to our team. We finished the regular season. That was back when you only played 11 games in a regular season. We finished six and five. Uh, we did get to a bowl game. We played UCLA, lost to them six to three, um, and and so we finished six and six on the season. But five of those six losses were by less than a touchdown, um, and and I feel like that was just a failure of the player leadership you know the coaches did the things that they needed to do to get us ready but we as a team when the chips were down in that fourth quarter we weren't finding a way to win and you know i'd always taken an approach to leadership as you know just lead by example i was i was probably a little more soft-spoken in in college um, than I was in, in high school. Um, but, uh, you know, I just, I think that wasn't the right approach for our particular team. And so I learned from my mistakes in working, you know, and in, in, uh, in getting to be a captain with, with my teammates that, you know, that approach wasn't the right one and I should have been able to find another one. And, you know, I'd also find it interesting that um, a lot of times when, you know, we get named as captains on the team, um, sometimes you don't, really know how to be a captain and so i would encourage anybody that's in that situation ask ask around ask your coaches ask your uh, uh your friends your peers your your uh you know your parents um there's there's a lot of advice out there and and i think it's important to to look at that and and learn and 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 try and absorb as much as you can in terms of being a leadership so unfortunately i don't have great words on necessarily how to do it, but I can tell you that I don't think I did it very well when I was in your shoes. And, and so I, again, I encourage you to ask for help if you need it and, and hopefully that'll, um, that'll serve you well. Hi, I'm Jacob Kraft, current aerospace engineering grad student at the University of Illinois. Uh, watching the live broadcast after the SpaceX Dragon capsule docked with the International Space Station, there were clearly a number of things that had to be done before opening the hatch and letting the crew on board. So does the crew get anxious at all as you wait for the hatch to open? Yeah, that's a great question. It is a uh, pretty busy timeline. Um, you know, and a lot of what we're doing is just waiting on leak checks. You know, so when we dock to the station, we have a docking adapter. The station has a docking adapter. They meet up, and that area between them is called the vestibule, and the vestibule is that vacuum. And so we have to uh, put air into that va into that vestibule. We have to uh, then make sure that it's not leaking. But in order to do that, you've got to have it thermally stabilized. Um, and so it just takes time. And and so do we get anxious a little bit? But on the other hand, we also have certain things we need to do. So for example, um, as soon as we get docked. We're, wa we're still monitoring. You know, you dock and you're watching the various systems, the hooks that are driving that are going to lock you to the station. So you're monitoring all of that. And then once you get in that stable configuration, they give you the go, for example, to get out of your seats, get out of your suits. But we have a lot of work to do once we do that. You know, you get out of your suits, you got to dry them, you got to clean them, because these are our suits that we're going to get into uh, when we come home at the end of the mission. And there are suits that we would need anytime during the mission as well in, a, in an emergency scenario. So you have tasks to do, you have procedures to do. And, and then when you do have a little bit of downtime, it was always good to grab a snack or a, a drink of water or something like that. Um, and, and uh, you know, just get yourself ready for getting on station and, and starting a six-month mission. So it can be long, but we have things to do. And in the big scheme of things, it, it really isn't that long. Hi, my name is Shivana Ganesh. I'm a current aerospace engineering student at the University of Illinois. And my question is, how has your experience with flight test engineering translated to your role as an astronaut? How did uh, flight test engineering translate to what I'm doing now? Um, you, you know, there's a, a very good translation. And, and so the, the vehicle that we came up in, for example, the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon, it's a new vehicle. And, and so we are the first operational flight. Um, we're the first, every day that we're up here, 
um, is a, a new record for a U.S. capsule being in space. And so that experience that I had in flight tests uh, with the Air Force is coming into play now. It's coming into play during uh, the, the when did I get assigned? I guess the, in August of 18 is when I first got assigned to SpaceX. And, and so all of that training, all of the testing that we did on the vehicle on the ground, um, it, it was a direct, uh, I, was, I was leaning on my experience. And in fact, that was probably a bit of the reason why I was selected for the mission I was, because I had that kind of background uh, to to uh, participate in the development and testing of these of these new vehicles, and and so, uh, but I would also say that uh, the experiences that that our other crew members have, like uh, again, I mentioned Dr. Kate Rubens, uh, she's a microbiologist, and up here it's all about doing science, and so I have leaned on her experience as well uh, because we have to do the science uh, as well, and and so she's got a great background in that, and she can really give you a lot of details, and so you just never know how your background's going to play out uh, in what you're doing uh, down the road, and, and for example, as as astronauts. Hi, I'm Anna Marie Buss, current aerospace engineering student at the University of Illinois. And my question is, if there were a new space station being built, what changes would you want to be made? Oh, wow. Uh, I think I got to be careful how I answer this one because uh, the, the folks on the ground might be listening. No, you know, I think you got to start with uh, what what's the mission of the space station? Uh, you know, this, this space station was built for science. It's built for um, learning how we can explore the solar system, how we can get to the moon, how we can go on to Mars. Um, but it's also for learning science or uh, doing science that helps us down on Earth. Um, and so with that in mind, that's, that has dictated a lot of what we, um, how the station was built. Uh, but if I had an opportunity, one of the things I would, uh, would focus on is giving the crew some dedicated space for just the day-to-day -day living type activities. And what I mean by that, for example, we don't have a dedicated place to do hygiene up here. Uh, when I say hygiene, I mean we don't have a place to, you know, just to brush our teeth or shave. Um, when we, we don't take showers up here, we take sponge baths, uh, but we don't have a place that's dedicated to do that. So what we actually use is uh, kind of our closet where we store a lot of our equipment. And, and so what that means is, uh, you know, you're going in to uh, find a piece of equipment to, to do some science or some maintenance or something. And at the same time, you're having to move your sweaty clothes out of the way while they're trying to dry. Uh, so little things like that, I think, are important. Um, the other thing, for example, having a dedicated kind of that galley area with a table that's that's kind of big enough for everybody to stand or, or yeah, float around. Uh, you know, the, the dinner table up here is, is very similar to all the homes uh, down on earth where, you know, a lot of times when you have people over, you kind of gather around that kitchen, you gather around the dinner table, you hang out, you talk. We do the same thing up here after ours. And so I would kind of dedicate some uh, spaces to that. Uh, you know, and I, boy, the list could go on and on. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but, you know, things like plants I would have up here. How do we handle trash? How do we handle the solid human waste? There's a lot of things that um, that we are we are exploring and getting better. And I think uh, a new station, I would tra certainly try and focus on some of those things as well. Hey, Mike. Uh, my name is Blake Hayes. I'm a punter for the Illinois football team and a kinesiology student. Uh, my question to you is, if you could go back and provide some advice to your college age self, what would that be? Wow. Uh, advice for myself. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and hey, Blake, it's uh, I've enjoyed watching you uh, you play and the difference that you've made in, in games. Uh, congratulations on just a, a wonderful career. Um, so, you know, I think the first thing I would, uh, advice I would give myself is to be patient. Um, again, I, I tend to, I mentioned to be a little intense. Uh, I always want things to happen uh, faster than they're necessarily meant to happen. And, and so I think that's uh, one of the things I would, would certainly tell myself is uh, just be patient. Things, things will happen uh, when they're supposed to. Uh, you know, one of the other things I, I mentioned as a captain um, I had some struggles there, and, and so I think one of the, the other pieces of advice is uh, I would give myself is be a good teammate, and in that case, being a good teammate probably would have meant going out and asking for some help on how to be a good captain. And, and so being a good teammate, I think, is a, a very important part. 
Um, and you know, the other one is uh, something that that has stuck with me, but I would uh, I would enforce that, and that is the never give up. Um, just keep keep driving, keep uh, pursuing your dreams, whatever they may be, uh, whether it's with football and football after college, or at some point uh, football is going to end and and there's going to be other things. So pursue those dreams and never give up on them. And uh, and so I, I think. Uh, you know, in general, I, I've been very fortunate, and, and some of my dreams have worked out. But uh, I think there certainly could have been um, some uh, some improvements along the way. Mike, this is Jonathan Friend, Department Head again. On behalf of the entire Illinois family, I want to thank you for your time. We wish you the smoothest possible mission and the safest possible return to Earth. And we have one more thing for you. <laughs> well, thank. <laughs> okay. Hey, Mike, it's Josh Whitman. Just wanted to say, hey, thanks for everything you're doing. C continue to represent the orange and blue the way you do every day. And uh, only one official way to wrap this up, and that's with an ILL. I and I. Hey, Josh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's great to be with you. I can't wait to get back to Earth and, and come visit. Um, I, you know, the there's just something special about the University of Illinois, uh, whether it's academics or whether it's the sports or whether it's just the, the student life there. Um, and, and so I, I just feel blessed to have been a part of it, and I can't wait to get back and, and be around it again. Thank you all.